Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Great Vic. If this is your church home or you're just visiting with us this evening, I trust you'll feel warmly at home well, uh, with us. I want to say also uh, a warm welcome to uh, Dr. David Luke. Where did you go, David? You're somewhere there. Yep, he's okay. Yeah, he's in the middle there. I think you're here also with your wife. Is there others with you then as well? Some family members? Great. Well, you're all welcome. Uh, David is here this evening. Uh, he is a professor at the Irish Baptist College, and he is here to help us think about uh, the subject uh, are the Gospels reliable? So later in the service, uh, he'll be sharing with us about that. Uh, and David, we're really delighted to have you. Thanks so much for being willing to come. Uh, hopefully you received a bulletin uh, on the way in. Simon covered most of the announcements this morning. They're all in there, but just uh, to remind you of a couple of things. Patty mentioned Saturday the 29th of January, 11 a.m. There's going to be uh, some evangelism training here down at the church. Simon also mentioned uh, a Mark drama. We're hoping to do this as a type of outreach uh, at Easter. Uh, Easter, Good Friday, Friday the 15th of April, and Saturday the 16th. We're going to have two evenings where we present the whole gospel of Mark, the text of the gospel, in a kind of dramatic way. Um, Simon's seeking a team of about 17 people to help put on that outreach event. So um, uh, if you're interested in helping out with that, do speak to Simon. There's going to be an information evening on the 13th of February, or sorry, an information morning after the morning service uh, on February the 13th. So note those down, and if you can help with that, uh, that would be really wonderful. Everything else sends in here, do make sure you get hold of a bulletin and read through it carefully. Now in 1 Peter 3.15, uh, Peter exhorts uh, his hearers and us who are gathered this evening, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. There's such a beautiful balance in that passage, confident hope, ready to defend and speak, yet always gently and with respect. So as we begin this evening, let's just turn to the Lord and ask that he would help us set apart in our hearts Christ the Lord as holy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together again this evening. And we know, Lord, that in the midst of this service, among other things, we're going to be sitting around your table and eating the bread and drinking the cup and remembering Christ's death and everything he accomplished through it. So as we gather this evening, as we sing the gospel and pray the gospel and dramatize the gospel in the Lord's Supper and preach the gospel through opening your word, we just pray that in our hearts, we would just set apart Christ, be nourished together in him, and be filled up and satisfied afresh in all the goodness there is for us in him. Thank you for each person here, and help us, Lord, help us to worship you this evening in spirit and in truth, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and we'll sing our first two songs, Only a Holy God and Beneath the Cross of Jesus.
and let's continue in worship as we unite our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God. We are here this evening to worship you, and Lord, that is that which delights our heart. For Father, Our God, you are an overflowing fountain of grace for us. In you is everything our dry and weary souls need. And so we come again this evening to you to be refreshed together. We come to look away from ourselves and to see in you this overflowing fountain of grace. And we want to say thank you, Father, for all your goodness to us, for you have created the heavens and the earth as a revelation of your splendor and majesty. You have not only created, but you uphold and sustain this universe with your power. You have created each of us, you know us intricately, and you are deeply interested in each of our lives. You know us by name. You know tonight our stresses and strains, our insecurities and fears. You know our joys and our hopes. You know everything that's going on in us. You're so interested. You love us. You care for us. And we want to thank you. And Father, as well as seeing into all of those ups and downs, you also see the reality of our struggle with sin. You see the thoughts that are displeasing to you the actions that we do, the things we should be doing that we're not doing. You see our neglecting the means of grace, busily running around in our lives and sometimes just forgetting you or not having time for you. And we want to come, Lord, tonight again and say we're sorry for our sin. And Father, thank you that in love, seeing our weakness, seeing our brokenness, thank you, Father, that in love you sent forth your Son the Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Savior. In love, you gave us your Son, Father, and you sent him on a mission, and he said that he came to seek and save the lost. He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He paid the debt of our sin, every bitter thought, every evil deed. He took it on himself, He suffered the consequences of our sin. He bore your wrath, Father. He paid our debt, and he died taking our sin to the grave. He satisfied your justice, your righteousness. Through his death, he fully paid our debt, and then he rose again. And because he could not be contained by death, he offers now hope and new life to us 
our old sinful selves, crucified with him, risen up to newness of life, made new creations in him, every sin washed away as far as the east is from the west. And now in his righteousness, we can come before you, Father, and we can rejoice in you, not having a cloud of guilt over us, but under the blue skies of your grace and mercy and peace. And Father, through your Son, you both sent forth the Holy Spirit who quickens us and gives us life, who convicts us of sin and righteousness and the judgment to come, who fills us with hope and assurance that we are your children, and your Spirit empowers us and gives us gifts that we might serve you and live for you. He stirs our affections. He opens our minds and our hearts to understand the things that are freely ours in Christ. And so together, our God, we praise you for this great salvation. We rejoice tonight in the hope that we have laid down in your word. And as we prepare, Lord, in a moment to move toward just remembering Jesus around the Lord's table as we continue to be nourished in your word, just bless us and meet us tonight where we are. You know our needs. You know if we're near to you or if we're drifting far away. You know, Father, if you need to send the shepherd afresh out to find us and bring us back in to the fold, please, Father, don't let us stray far. Draw back in your people, your children, your sheep, and fill us, Lord, with your joy afresh this evening, for we rejoice in you, and you are the joy of all our joys. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Adam Riley's going to come and read for us from God's Word with two passages from Luke's Gospel and 2 Timothy. Thanks, Adam. Our first reading is taken from Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And our second reading is 2 Timothy chapter 3, 14 through 17. So Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. And Second Timothy Three verses 14 through 17. Verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is the word of God. Great, thanks Adam. As we prepare to come to the Lord's table together, let's just stand and we'll sing the first two verses of this great hymn before the throne of God above.
seated. Now, for anyone visiting or perhaps not accustomed to what we're doing just now, let me take a moment to explain what we're doing. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he instituted a meal of remembrance for his people so that they could remember his death and everything that he accomplished through it. On that night, he took bread and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After that, he took a cup of wine and he said that this cup represented the cup of the new covenant established through his death. He told his people to eat and drink and that this would be a meal that helps us to remember him and that we were to practice that until he would come again. So down through the years, ever since that moment, over 2,000 years now, the church of Jesus Christ has been gathering all across the nations this very simple little meal that means so much. For here, as we come together as one people and eat the bread, we're remembering that there is one fountain of life and forgiveness and grace and mercy for us, and we come together all level ground to this one Savior, one Lord, and find in Him everything we need for forgiveness and mercy. So there's a great sense as we come to eat and drink together that we're in this together. The people sitting to the left and right of you in front and behind you, they all need exactly the same grace that you need. We're really in this together. And so the bread, there's nothing magical about it. it. It points to the brokenness of Christ's body, the one who loved us and gave himself for us as we drink the cup. It reminds us of Christ's death. But as we eat and drink, we trust that God's Spirit is nourishing us again in a fresh way as we remember Christ and everything he accomplished for us. So if you know and love the Lord Jesus and you're in good standing with your local church, you're welcome to share in this meal of remembrance with us. If you're here and you're not a Christian and you're not able to eat and drink proclaiming that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, that's okay. We're so glad that you're here. And we would encourage you not to eat of the bread or drink of the cup, but to take this instead as a moment just to reflect and think about what's holding you back from trusting in the Lord and where you stand before the Lord. So let's be still for a few moments. Let's just invite God to search our hearts. Let's inwardly and quietly be confessing our sins and seeking to approach this moment in a worthy manner as we remember that Christ alone is our hope. Let's be still and then I'll lead us in a prayer giving thanks for the bread and the cup. Lord Jesus, you told us to do this in remembrance of you. Lord, this is the meal that really expounds history. We look back and we remember the center point of, point of the universe, the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. We remember this today and are nourished afresh as we remember that we're not enslaved by our sin anymore. We've been liberated from it all because of Jesus. And in the eating the bread and drinking the cup, we taste and anticipate the future, that day when Jesus will return and we will sit down in the fullness of everything that this meal points back to and points forward to. And Father, as we come to you as one people, coming to the fountain of cleansing alone that there is in your Son. We stand together under the grace of this life-giving fountain. Every one of us, Lord, need the same Savior, the same life, the same forgiveness. 
And so, Lord, we come to eat from this one loaf that speaks to us of the one Savior who nourishes us in the deepest parts of our souls. Thank you, Father, for the bread, for everything that it speaks to us of. We thank you for the glorious reality of your Son who loved us and gave himself for us. And in his name we pray. Amen. If you can just take a moment to have your bread at the ready, please. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together as one. Father, as we thank you for the, the bread, we thank you for the cup, this cup that speaks to us of the new covenant, the new life that is ours in Christ, our sins not counted against us, set free. We don't have to live under the cloud of guilt and condemnation anymore because your Son has set us free, and the one whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you can have your cup at the ready, please. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink together as one. And let's just take a moment to be still and give thanks in our hearts. Father, it is just so wonderful that we're not defined primarily by our sin anymore. That sin is defeated, it is crushed under your son's feet, and we stand united with your son, and he defines us. He is our true identity. We are, if we are Christ's, we are in Christ. The old sinful self crucified with him and gone. And we live, the life we live in the flesh, we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. So thank you, Lord, that our identity is those in Christ, saved, righteous, with an incredible hope, an incredible inheritance. And we thank you so much for the liberty we have in your Son Amen. Amen. Well, we'll respond and sing uh, verse 2 again of Before the Throne of God and into verse 3. Let's stand together uh, and sing. And then afterwards, David's going to come and teach us. Thanks.
please do be seated. I'll just pray for David as he comes forward to speak to us. Father, we do just commit this time to you. Help your servant, David. Help us to be attentive and bless us together in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, David. Well, good evening, folks. It's uh, good to be back with you here uh, again this evening uh, in Great Vic. Uh, haven't been here in a while. Uh, I think this is uh, the first time I've possibly uh, been here wearing my college hat, and it's uh, always good uh, to uh, uh, get out and about and wear your, uh, wear your college hat. Now, since I was coming here, I couldn't quite bring you an exclusive offer, uh, but I have certainly brought you uh, something uh, a little, well, entirely new, entirely new. It's this recent production uh, from the Irish Baptist College. Uh, no one has seen this before. Uh, it was literally put into my hand on Thursday, hot off the press. Uh, and this uh, enables folk uh, to take this little uh, leaflet and it's a little uh, seven-day prayer guide, uh, and it guides you through things that you might pray uh, for the Irish Baptist College uh, every day. Uh, so I brought uh, some of these along, uh, and they're on the table uh, outside, uh, along with some other literature uh, about the Irish Baptist College, uh, some of which uh, relates to the courses that we run, uh, some of which relates to different ways in which you can support uh, the work of the college, and if you're really, really keen, uh, there's even an application form out there. Uh, so unfortunately, I have just one, uh, but I would be more than happy uh, if, if, several, uh, if several were required. But I uh, do uh, continue to uh, take the work of the Irish Baptist College, please, uh, upon your heart. We really do uh, appreciate uh, your partnership uh, in this work. Uh, we appreciate uh, Steve's uh, work with us on, on the Board of Studies. Uh, we appreciate the fact that uh, Adam uh, is here and your partnership with us uh, in that way. So uh, do continue, please, to remember uh, the work uh, of, the, of the Irish Baptist College. Well, we are going to uh, think together this evening uh, about this uh, subject. Uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, can we uh, trust uh, the Gospels? Well, uh, let me begin uh, by telling you a, a little story about myself. Uh, I'm not sure, have we... Uh, little screen behind us. Yep, okay, that will uh, keep, me, uh, keep me right. Uh, a little story about myself. When I was a boy, uh, I collected uh, some tokens. Uh, as far as I recall, they were from crisp packets. Um, and having collected enough, I sent away for some imitation Wild West wanted posters. And uh, these posters uh, featured uh, such uh, notorious outlaws as Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Uh, Jesse James and uh, Billy the Kid. Uh, so one of these Billy the Kid posters uh, was on my wall uh, for a while. Uh, and the one uh, featuring uh, Billy the Kid uh, was, uh, you'll see, signed uh, by Lou Wallace, governor of New Mexico. Oh, I'm going, the, going the wrong way. Uh, yep, uh, so Lou Wallace was governor uh, of New Mexico. Now, I didn't know at the time that Lou Wallace was actually one of the most famous men in 19th century America. He was a war hero, uh, credited uh, with saving Washington uh, during the American Civil War, and he served for a time as the American ambassador to Turkey. And actually, because of his association, particularly with Billy the Kid, uh, he's been portrayed numerous times in films. Do you ever watch any of those old westerns? I'll watch out for the name Lou Wallace. But I also found out later that Lou Wallace was an ardent skeptic uh, about Christianity. He was a friend of another uh, skeptic called Robert Ingersoll, who was another lawyer uh, and another Civil War veteran. Um, Ingersoll was nicknamed the Great Agnostic. Uh, he was the most famous agnostic uh, in the United States. And it was Ingersoll who set Wallace the challenge of writing what he said to Wallace will be the crowning work of your life a scholarly repudiation of Jesus Christ, and consequently of the Christian religion. Well, typically, uh, Wallace set about the work with great energy. Uh, he spent several years gathering all the materials he could in the United States and Europe, until finally he was ready to write his book. 
Having written nearly four chapters of the work, Wallace found himself reaching an unexpected conclusion. He was forced to admit that Jesus Christ was a real historical figure. In his own words, he was now in an uncomfortable position and had to ask himself, if he was a real person and there was no doubt, was he not then also the Son of God and the Savior of the world? And Wallace came to conclude that he was indeed the Son of God and that he was the Savior of the world. Wallace became a Christian. So he set out to repudiate Christianity, but it ended up becoming a Christian. And it was having become a Christian that Wallace then wrote his crowning work. It wasn't a repudiation of Jesus, but it was the story of a Jew whose bitterness was transformed whenever he encountered the historical Jesus. That book's not very well known uh, today, but the movie based on the book is one of the most famous in the history of cinema, the work Ben-Hur. Now, Wallace's story is by no means unique. Now, for many people who have set out to dismantle the Christian faith, they have, through their research, come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and the Savior of mankind. Well, why do I start by telling you this uh, this evening? Well, it's because at the outset I want to issue you tonight with an invitation. It's an invitation to truly investigate the Christian faith. It's an invitation to dig into the Christian faith and to really think about it. And if you're prepared to do so, then you too might come to some rather surprising conclusions. One of the problems that you will face this evening is a cultural one. That is, we live in a culture that is unfavorable to Christianity. Across the United Kingdom, church attendance runs at about 15%. So, does that mean the other 85% of the population are atheists? Well, the figure for atheists is rather generously put at 20% of the population. So that leaves 65% of the population who are unaccounted for. And as one researcher has said, they're made up of maybes, doubters, and don't knows. So it points to the reality that while the majority of people living in our society may not be Christian, they have simply never really thought through the issues one way or the other. Instead, influenced by our cultural climate, they have often made certain assumptions about the Christian faith that have led them to dismiss it without really thinking about it. For example, they think, well, Jesus never really existed. Or maybe they think the Bible's full of mistakes. Or maybe they think that, that science has disproved the Bible, and so on and so forth. Or they perhaps made certain assumptions about Christians. Oh, well, they're just Christians because of their upbringing. They're just Christians because they're a bit naive. No, they're just Christians because they don't know about the problems, or they're just Christians because they're needy, and so on and so forth. I suspect this evening that if you're not a Christian, this may well be true of you. It's not that you've really investigated Christianity and found it to be flawed. Rather, you have assumed that it's flawed and have never really investigated it. And so, this evening, what I want to do is to invite you to begin along a path of investigating the Christian faith, to really think about it seriously, perhaps even for the first time in your life, to really think about it seriously. And as I said, it may well lead you to some surprising conclusions. Well, where do we start to investigate the Christian faith? Well, the Christian faith is all about Jesus who He is, and what He has done. Well, how do, how do we know about Jesus? Well, the place we learn about Jesus is in the Bible, and in particular, the Gospels. And that may well raise an objection in your mind. Aren't all the Gospels biased? Aren't all the Gospels biased? Well, let me say it at the outset, absolutely. Absolutely. They're completely biased because the authors of the Gospels want to persuade us about the truth of Jesus Christ. 
Listen to the opening words of Mark's gospel, where Mark writes, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's Mark right at the outset setting out his agenda. He's going to tell us about Jesus. He's going to tell us that He is the Christ, that is, He's God's anointed Savior, not that He is the Son of God, and He's going to tell us that this is good news. This is the gospel, good news. Well, does such bias, does such an agenda mean then, well, Mark must be unreliable? He has an agenda. Not at all. One of the most famous trials of the 20th century was that of Holocaust architect Adolf Eichmann in 1961. The prosecution called over 100 witnesses, witnesses who one after another related their experiences of the horrors of the Holocaust. And nobody, nobody challenged their testimony as being unreliable because they were biased. In fact, their testimony was incredibly powerful because the people who bore witness had participated in these events and were deeply affected by them. Had they been completely dispassionate, it would have been odd in the extreme. Rather, here were people deeply affected by the events in which they had participated, the things that they had witnessed. And so it is with the gospel writers. They bear testimony to events in which some of them were involved, about which they were deeply affected. We should not be surprised, if you like, at their bias. We should not be surprised that they reached certain conclusions. Acknowledging this, their testimony should, however, provoke us to ask, well, why? Why did they reach these conclusions? You see, the gospel writers are not trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes. And so they're inviting us to examine in the evidence that's set before us so that we too might share in their conclusions. Well, when we turn then to these New Testament accounts of Jesus' life and consider their trustworthiness, it does ask us to consider a number of questions. And the first of these, I think, we might ask is when were the Gospels written? When were the Gospels written? It's become popular in some quarters today to assert that the Gospels were written long after the events that they recorded. If Jesus died around 30 to 33 AD, then it's been suggested by some that the Gospels were not written until maybe a hundred years after these events. So how could they be reliable? However, the truth is that scholarship has demonstrated that the Gospels were written much closer to the events that they record. Mark, for example, was written in the mid to late fifties. Matthew, the late fifties to early sixties. Luke, uh, the mid to late sixties. John, seventy to a hundred. So, thinking about it in this way, Mark, the earliest gospel, was written at the latest about 25 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. Less than a generation later, Mark had written these things down. But actually, there are even earlier records relating to Jesus. And we find those in Paul's letters. Although the Gospels appear first in our New Testament, some of Paul's letters were actually written still earlier. The earliest of these, Thessalonians, or perhaps Galatians, were written less than 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. In fact, if we were to lose all access to the Gospels and still retain Paul's letters, we would still be able to reconstruct the key facts of what we know from the Gospels about the life of Jesus, of His birth, His life, His death, His resurrection, ascension, and His message. So, the Gospels themselves are beginning to be written down for the first time around 25 years after the events surrounding Jesus' life. Paul is writing about these things less than 20 years later, all of which tells us that very quickly after Jesus' life, 
his followers were committing to writing the material that we find in the New Testament. Let me put that a little bit in perspective. My dad wrote his life story. When he did, he was 90. But here we find, within a generation, here are people writing down the facts about Jesus. Oh, another important question then is, who wrote the Gospels? We ask this question because we want to know about the authority of the authors of the Gospels. What authority had these people to write these things down? Where did they obtain their material? Well, again, Matthew uh, is uh, the first of the Gospels in our, um, uh, in our Bibles. Like all the Gospels, Matthew's Gospel actually was originally anonymous. So the first people who read this would have read it as an anonymous document. He was, after all, writing for people who knew him. However, from the early second century, there was an established tradition that the author of the first Gospel was Matthew, the former tax collector who was one of Jesus' twelve disciples. And this tradition is significant since those who were part of the early church either had direct or indirect contact with the apostles. In other words, if people had falsely claimed that this message was written by Matthew, there would have been those alive who would have said, no, it wasn't. There were still those alive who would have been able to contradict this, but they didn't do so. So, we can conclude fairly that the gospel was written by Matthew, one of Jesus' followers, someone who was an eyewitness to these events. Well, then we have Mark. Again, we have strong attestation from the early second century, something again no one contested, that Mark's gospel was written by John Mark, who we know from the book of Acts was attached to the apostles and their company. We also know from the same testimony that what Mark did was to write down the Apostle Peter's account of the events surrounding the life of Jesus. So again, here we find a gospel that is based upon eyewitness accounts of these events. Then we have Luke, again with strong attestation from the mid-second century that Luke, the doctor and traveling companion, of the Apostle Paul is the author of Luke's gospel. Now, Luke was not an eyewitness of these events that he describes surrounding the life of Jesus. But he does give us that fascinating insight that Adam read for us earlier into how he composed the gospel. Let's look at those words again for a moment or two in Luke 1, 1 to 4. He writes, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were from the first eyewitnesses and servants of the Word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that have been taught. So, what's he saying? He's saying that his gospel is based upon eyewitness accounts from the apostles and others who were there from the beginning, and it's based upon his own careful investigation into the life of Jesus. If you read through Luke's gospel, interestingly, he is the only author who talks about Jesus' boyhood. He's the only author who talks about Jesus' boyhood. Well, where did he learn about Jesus' boyhood? Well, it seems reasonable to conclude from what he writes elsewhere, that he was told these things by Jesus' mother Mary, because he writes a lot about what Mary experienced as well. And finally, we have John's gospel. Again, there is strong attestation from the early second century, again, no one's contesting this, that the author of the fourth gospel is John, the son of Zebedee, who was one of Jesus' twelve disciples. There's also a strong internal evidence to support this fact, notably John's many references to himself as the apostle whom Jesus loved. Especially he's there in conjunction with Peter and John, along with Peter and James, 
form part of Jesus' inner circle of disciples. So again, we find the fourth gospel is written by another eyewitness, another participant in the events that he records for us on the page. So what we find in the Gospels about Jesus is either recorded by those who were eyewitnesses, Matthew and John, or is recorded by those who relied upon eyewitness accounts, Mark and Luke. And again, we might add to this the witness of the Apostle Paul. As we've noticed, his works are sprinkled with a considerable number of references to the life of Jesus. And this is significant since Paul himself was present during the birth of Christianity, first as a persecutor and then as an apostle. Furthermore, when we turn to the other New Testament books, we find that several of them are written by the disciples themselves. So, John writes four New Testament books, Peter writes another two, or we find them written by Jesus' brothers, Jude and James. Another 13 are written by Paul and another by Luke. In other words, when we turn to the Gospels, what we find are that the books of the New Testament are essentially composed by those who were there. They were written by those who were there. They were those who knew Jesus and were witnesses to Him and who heard His message. Or they knew those who did. Jesus is far and away the best attested figure in the ancient world. We even know about his existence from ancient writers outside the Bible who were opposed to him. And they recognized that this man, Jesus, lived. Well, that might all be well and good, but perhaps some people will say, well, hasn't the Bible been corrupted? Hasn't the New Testament been corrupted? It's a popular idea that through the centuries the New Testament text has become corrupted. Or is it sometimes stated quite simply, well, isn't the Bible full of mistakes? However, this is simply not the case. Let's look a little at the manuscript evidence. The earliest fragment of a Bible book in existence is from the Gospel of John. So, we have a little fragment from the Gospel of John. It dates from around 125 AD. That is around 35 years after John wrote Revelation, the last book of the Bible, about 35 years after that. And in total, there are 114 fragments of the New Testament dated within 50 years of Revelation being written. There are then 200 full manuscripts of New Testament books a century later. So, in other words, we have a lot of early manuscript evidence regarding the original biblical texts. Let me put this into perspective. Tacitus, the Roman historian, was writing about 100 AD. That's slightly later than John wrote Revelation. The earliest copy of a manuscript by Tacitus dates from 1,000 years later. 1,000 years later. We find similar patterns with other ancient manuscripts. For example, the oldest manuscript of a work by Julius Caesar is from 900 years after his death, and that's only a partial manuscript. There's also evidence drawn from the writers in the early church. When we look at the writings of the early church, we find there are a considerable number of second-century Christians quoting from the New Testament books. Bruce Metzger uh, was one of the foremost authorities in the world of New Testament textual criticism. And he wrote, so extensive are these citations from the early church authors that of all other sources for our knowledge of the text of the New Testament was destroyed, they would be sufficient alone for the reconstruction of practically the entire New Testament. So, around a century after the Gospels were written, people knew them, and they were quoting from them extensively. And we should also note how carefully this text has been preserved. New Testament scholar Craig Blomberg writes, even the most cautious estimates suggest that over 97 percent 
Over 97% of the New Testament Scriptures are completely beyond dispute. In other words, we pretty much have before us the New Testament manuscripts as they were originally written. And as for the remaining 2.5% or so, there's nothing there that affects any major doctrine of the Bible. So far from the New Testament being corrupted or the Bible being full of mistakes, we have a remarkable body of evidence pointing to the original writing. So much so that whenever scholars do discover a copious error, it's like a flashing red light to them. It stands out an absolute mile. Okay, so far so good perhaps, but aren't there other Gospels that tell us a different story? That's an idea that's grown popular in recent years, especially due to the work of Dan Brown's seamless blend of fact and fiction, The Da Vinci Code. And yes, there are other Gospels that tell a different story. There are Gospels like the Gospel of Thomas, and did you know there's even a Gospel of Judas? So, how are we to think about these other Gospels? Well, the first thing to say is that although people tend to wheel these things out from time to time as if they're amazing uh, new discoveries, uh, if you're a fan of the Discovery Channel, you'll perhaps know that, uh, these things are nothing of the sort. They're nothing of the sort. From earliest times, Christians have been aware of these alternative Gospels, and they've rejected them. For example, the Gospel of Thomas was discovered amongst some ancient manuscripts in Egypt in 1946. The copy discovered dates from 340 A.D., around 340 A.D. However, we do know that it had already been rejected as inauthentic back in the third century. This was because, first of all, it wasn't written until the middle of the second century, and therefore it had no connection with the apostles and their companions. And secondly, its message is not, in fact, the message of the gospel, but of an early Christian heresy we call Gnosticism. So, yes, there are other gospels. The church has always known there are other gospels. But like the gospel of Thomas, they were composed at the earliest in the second century. They were not written by the people in whose names they claimed to be written, so everybody knew it wasn't written by Thomas. Thomas was dead a hundred years. It wasn't written by him. And their message is not the message of the gospel. And furthermore, these gospels, when they do speak of Jesus, add nothing to our knowledge of Jesus, because what they do say about him actually shows their dependence on the existing gospel. Well, perhaps Dan Brown has persuaded you a little better, and you're maybe asking, isn't it true that the Emperor Constantine decided in the fourth century which books should be in the New Testament? Again, as I say, here's an idea that again owes its popularity to Dan Brown. One of Brown's characters in the Da Vinci Code says, the fundamental irony of Christianity, the Bible as we know it today was collated by the pagan Roman Emperor Constantine the Great straight out of the words, uh, straight out of the mouths of one of his characters. But again, dear old Dan, nothing could be further from the truth. The idea of a Christian canon or a Christian collection of books based on the authoritative writings of the apostle and their companions was already well established by the middle of the second century. And so, for example, Irenaeus, writing around the middle of the second century, identifies for us as canonical 21 of the 27 books that now make up the New Testament. Whilst later in the same century, we have a collection of books called the Muratorian Fragment that recognizes as canonical 24 of the 27 books that now make up the New Testament. But what is of particular interest, hopefully, to us this evening is that by the middle of the second century, there was already a clear understanding that there were only four authentic Gospels. And that seems to have been well understood at least as early as 115 A.D., in other words, within 20-odd years of the death of John. So, by the time of the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D., the canon of the New Testament was actually well established. It had nothing at all to do with Constantine. In fact, it was so well established that Constantine could command Eusebius, an early church historian, 
in 331 AD to 50 copies of the New Testament prepared uh, so that he could send them to his new capital city of Constantinople. So what can we say by way of summary this evening? In summary, what we find in the New Testament as we have it in our Bibles today are the writings of the apostles and their companions, many of whom were eyewitnesses to the events that they describe. These things were written down very soon after the events. Furthermore, a large volume of carefully transcribed manuscripts dating back to less than 50 years after the death of the last apostle indicate that what we have for us in our Bibles are the authentic words of the original author. Now, as I said at the outset, I want to invite you this evening to take seriously the claims of the New Testament regarding Jesus. In the 1950s, an American student called Josh Medole went to uh, college. Uh, he was an agnostic. And he got so frustrated with the Christians in his college and their claims about Jesus that he decided he would investigate these claims for himself, uh, and he would expose Jesus as a fraud. He would completely dismantle the message of Jesus. But through his investigations, Madol, like Lou Wallace, became a Christian. He then set about collecting the evidence about Jesus that he himself had found so persuasive. And he put this together in his most famous book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And that, this evening, is what I want to suggest that I have begun to set before you. Evidence that demands a verdict. Evidence that the New Testament provides us with a reliable historical record of Jesus of Nazareth. Who he is, what he did, and what he claimed. Well, why does any of that matter? Well, it matters because, as Mark says at the outset of his gospel, this is the good news about Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. It matters because of what the New Testament says about Jesus is true. It has the most profound implications for our lives and for our world. You see, Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is not a philosophy. It's not a way of life. Christianity is all about Jesus, who He is and what He has done. That Jesus is, as He said, the Son of God. That as the Apostle John says, He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. However, the Son of God entered the world as a man into an obscure Palestinian backwater. There, from the age of 30, he carried on a public ministry where he performed miracles, healed the sick, and taught with great authority. In doing so, he made some remarkable claims about himself. Not the least of these was, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is, that it's only through Him that we can have our sins forgiven, enter into a relationship with God, and receive the gift of eternal salvation. And in order to open up the way to a restored relationship with God, He deliberately submitted Himself to death upon the cross. So that by his death upon the cross, he may take the wrath of God for our sins upon himself and in turn give to us the gift of eternal life. And indeed, to show that his death for our sins was acceptable to God and that he can indeed grant us the gift of eternal life, God raised him from the dead, a fact to which the New Testament witnesses bear testimony. And raising him from the dead, God vindicated Jesus' claims to be both Son of God and Savior. 
the anointed Savior of the world. Of course, if Jesus did not live, if His claims are not true, if He did not die in our place, if He did not rise from the dead, then the claims of Christianity are indeed a fraud. And Christians, as the New Testament admits, are the most deluded and hopeless people you could ever hope to meet. On the other hand, if the claims of the New Testament are true, then Mark is right that this is the gospel. This is the good news. This is news that is beyond compare that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior who has come to deliver us from the power and penalty of sin and to reconcile us to God. So tonight, let me again issue that invitation to you to investigate the claims of the Christian faith, to really begin to dig into these. And if you do so with a humble and open heart, then God will guide you by His Spirit into all truth. And you will make some remarkable discoveries. Above all this evening, let me urge you not to dismiss the claims of Christianity without a thorough investigation. Do not this evening die of ignorance. Do not die of ignorance. Do not let ignorance lead you into eternal condemnation. Let me finish this evening with some words from C.S. Lewis. Lewis was himself an arch-skeptic and atheist. And having become a Christian, Lewis wrote of the Gospels, as a literary historian, I am perfectly convinced that whatever else the Gospels are, they are not legends. I have read a great deal of legend, and I am quite clear that they are not the same sort of thing. His conclusion was that the authors re recorded what they had witnessed or what others had witnessed, that this was a new genre of writing. This was historically based eyewitness testimony. And of course, he famously then noted, you must make a choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank You that You sent Your Son Jesus to be our Savior. Father, we thank You that this is indeed good news, that the one by whom and for whom and through whom all things were made entered into His creation to rescue us. Father, we thank You that He did so by way of the cross, and that You confirmed this when You raised Him from the dead. Father, we do pray that You would open our understanding this evening, Father, to realize fully the truth, the veracity, the historicity of these matters, that, Father, we might indeed truly trust in Jesus, not simply as an historical figure, but as the one who is the living Lord, able to impart to us the gift of eternal life. Father, we ask these things in His precious name. Amen. Thanks so much, David. That was so helpful and encouraging. Now we're going to stand and respond uh, by singing. Uh, Jesus is Lord, the cry that echoes through creation. I thought this would be a great hymn uh, to respond to this time uh, singing, The Lordship of Christ. Let's stand together and sing.
now may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please do.